everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome to the second lecture in the spring um, 21 series on Gandhara, co-sponsored by the Tang Center for Silk Road Studies and the Center for Buddhist Studies at UC Berkeley. As mentioned earlier, uh, this series was developed in conjunction with the Beyond Boundaries Buddhist Art of Gandhara exhibition, which is scheduled to open later this spring at the Berkeley Art Museum. Uh, conceived and organized by Julia White, who is the senior curator at the Berkeley Art Museum, and Osman Boperacci, who, by the way, will join us a little bit later, um, former UC Berkeley adjunct professor of Central and South Asian art, archaeology, and numismatics. Um, the exhibition draws from public and private collections uh, and aims to highlight the cross-cultural setting of the region from the 2nd to the 10th centuries CE. Now, before we get to the moderator and speaker of today's event, I would once again like to go over the format. As this is a webinar, the audience is hidden from view. Therefore, if you have any questions regarding the content of the talk, please use the Q&A button to type them in, and we will do our best to convey your thoughts to the speaker. Now, for technical problems, uh, on the other hand, please use the chat button which will be monitored by our webinar host, Sky von Balkenberg. Now, the first talk in the series back in February by Pia Brancaccio highlighted the performative aspects of Gandharan relief. And today's talk will highlight the importance of Gandhara, Gandharan Buddhist reliquaries. Now, to introduce Richard Solomon, I've asked UC Berkeley professor Alexander von Rospat to do the honors. Alex is professor of Buddhist and South Asian Studies and Director of the Group in Buddhist Studies at UC Berkeley. He specializes in the doctrinal history of Indian Buddhism and will speak to the manifold uh, contributions of our speaker, Professor Richard Solomon, to the advancement of Buddhist studies. Alex, uh, the floor is yours, or rather the box is yours, so please go ahead. Thank you, um, Sanjot, for um, kicking the event off. And thank you very much, uh, Professor Solomon, for uh, joining under these strange and difficult circumstances. It's wonderful that we have these events. And uh, one of the few upsides of the pandemic is to have events in um, this um, format. Um, it's my great uh, honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Solomon. Um, he in many ways doesn't need an introduction. He is uh, one of the most celebrated figures in our field. And of course, he's changed the field of Buddhist studies by the work he's done for the excavation of Gandharan Buddhism, if I may uh, call it that. Um, Professor Solomon um, earned his um, BA in Oriental Studies with a minor in religion at Columbia University in 1970 and then moved on to the University of Pennsylvania where he earned his PhD in 1975. He is a Sanskritist and Indologist as we would say in Europe and um, very broad and eminent as such. When um, the Gandharan finds surfaced in Europe, basically in London in the early 90s, 1990s, um, they were looking at, kind of know this a little bit personally because I happened to be in London around at that time, and they were looking for the appropriate person to choose to basically work on these materials. And uh, Professor Solomon was an obvious choice with his epigraphical skills, his very broad linguistic skills, which um, include not only Sanskrit, but all of the uh, principal Middle Indic um, derivatives. And his broad training also as an endologist um, with a, a deep understanding of um, the literary history and religious history of Hinduism and also Buddhism. And somebody who at the same time brings the mindset of a historian to the study of his material. Um, honors have um, come to uh, Professor Solomon. He was appointed in 2015 university professor or honor, honored with an honor, uh, university professorship at um, his university in um, the University of uh, Washington. And um, he served as president of the International Association of Buddhist Studies and of the American Oriental Society. 
may be more important for our purposes since 1996. He's directing uh, the early Buddhist manuscript project at the University of Washington, and he's been the general editor of the Gandharan Buddhist text series. The importance of this material, not just the textual material, but also the material culture that has come to us and we're going to hear about reliquaries once Professor Solomon will start the uh, lecture. The importance of this material can really not be overstated. Once upon a time, uh, we were very much um, kind of stuck with what we knew about the Pali tradition from Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia on the one hand, and then the few remnants of um, the Indian tradition in Gilgit and more importantly, the survival of the Indian tradition in Nepal. And um, with Gandhara, we have a very, in many ways, a crucial additional uh, piece to the puzzle to understand the beginnings of um, Buddhism outside of the Pali tradition, in addition to it supplementing it, in many ways taking precedent over it. Um, it's not only the numerous uh, publications that Professor Solomon uh, uh, wrote and that are so important for the field, but he's also been institutionally very important um, training scholars who are bearing the torch. Um, I'm thinking of Stefan Baums, who brought Gandharan studies to Munich, where he, um, together with Professor Hartmann, established a big project for uh, Gandharan studies. And of course, there are other areas the world over where people are basically working and continuing the legacy um, um, of Professor um, Solomon or continuing the work he um, started um, to do. Before um, Professor Solomon start, before the, you know, Gandharan material surfaced and Professor Solomon was kind of selected as the most um, well-qualified person to take this on, he worked as a historian and he worked particularly as an epigraphist, that's why people uh, choose him. He has a monograph on the shell inscription, Sankalipi, to use the Sanskrit word. And um, as I mentioned before, he's deeply invested in the religious history of India. Um, he uh, worked on a um, treatise on pilgrimage, Narayambhata's Tristali Setu, uh, focusing on the Samanya Pragataka a section of it, that is on the section dealing with the rules and precepts. And he's returned to Tirthas and Yatras um, uh, later in the Smriti literature and also in Southeast Asia. But he's better known for his epigraphical work, his Indian epigraphy, a guide to the study of inscriptions in Sanskrit and pra Prakrit and other Indo-Aryan languages continues to be the standard work on Indian ep epigraphy, at least non-Dravidian Indian epigraphy. We all start with this when we look at epigraphical um, resources. And then he has a long uh, number of monographs, partly co-authored, partly authored on himself on particular texts from Gandhara that he and his project have worked on. And I'm kind of particularly grateful to Professor Solomon that uh, a lot of the material he's been unearthing over the last two decades have been summarized in a wonderful form in a monograph uh, entitled Buddhist Literature of Ancient Gandhara, an introduction with selected translations. It's a really superb way of uh, bringing um, the, um, the work that has been done, the very specialized work, to a broader audience and also drawing out the particular contributions he's made through this. Um, aptly last year, um, this book garnered the Kiense Foundation Prize for Outstanding Buddhist Translations. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the many um, contributions that will, I have no doubt, stand the test of time. Um, Professor um, Solomon is um, very broad. Um, we all know him through his work on Gandhara and Gandharan texts, but he's contributed, I mentioned his words on Tirtha, he's contributed on the Upanishads, on uh, the epics, um, he's worked on um, more specific historical talk texts 
He wrote on Kalhana's Raja Tarangini. He wrote a paper on the Kshatrapas and Mahakshatrapas of India. The list um, goes on and on. It also includes works that are um, more linguistic in their import. But um, I would take up uh, the time that deserves to him rather than to me introducing him if I went through them. So allow me, Professor Solomon, allow me, Richard, to welcome you at least in this kind of electronic way to Berkeley and uh, to invite you to talk about Buddhist reliquaries, the inscriptions on them, and what we can learn from them about the social and political history of the Gandharan region. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, thank you, Alex, for a very generous introduction, and thank you to Sanjot and uh, Osmond and everyone else who arranged this event. Uh, very sorry I can't be there in Berkeley in person, but uh, probably will be the minute it becomes possible. I'll be down there. Uh, so see you, see you soon. Uh, I think I'll begin my PowerPoint presentation now. Uh, good. So uh, I'm starting with this image of a, a very beautiful uh, Gandharan reliquary and its lavish containers. Uh, and uh, here it tells you that it's the reliquary of a king named Ajita Sena who ruled in the, king, the kingdom that he called Odi, which corresponds to what in model, modern terms is the lower Swat Valley in, in Pakistan. And uh, he ruled around, right around the beginning of the first century CE, maybe even a little earlier than that. As usual, we don't have uh, specific dates. Um, so this shows the uh, very beautiful reliquary, except that its neck is broken off. Uh, this is now in a museum, private museum in Japan. And it shows you the reliquary and everything that was found inside it. And the contents are uh, fairly typical of what you get in a Gandharan reliquary of the ornate type. Uh, you have a one large container and a smaller one in, in silver, one in uh, copper or brass, one in silver and a little one in gold. And these would all be fit inside each other like uh, Russian doll style. Uh, and inside the gold container would be an even smaller gold container, very elaborate filigree. And inside that would have been the actual relic, the ashes or bits of bone of the Buddha, or so at least the faithful would have believed. Uh, and there are various other things that were found inside the reliquary, and it's uh, the usual uh, kind of assembly. Uh, these gold flowers are very common, bits of jewelry, beads, and so forth. And one more thing, which to my mind is the most important thing, is this what looks like a crumpled up piece of paper, which is actually a gold leaf containing an inscription. Uh, and the inscription is something like this. Uh, here, this is a black and white photograph. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have a color, good color photograph of that gold leaf, but it is gold. And uh, if you look closely, maybe you can uh, actually see that there is uh, writing on it, although it's hard to discern among all the, the uh, crumpled folds. Uh, and this is a partial translation, uh, couldn't fit the whole translation on one slide, but this is meant to uh, just to give you a general idea of the uh, contents. And the key word, which I've actually circled here for people who might be interested and have very good eyes, this is the word in the text, it's prati. Prati Taveti in the Gandhari text, which corresponds to Sanskrit to Pratishtapayati, which is always translated as establishes. Uh, and I'm emphasizing this because kind of, this is kind of a key word in the whole conception of uh, the relic cult, the Buddhist relic cult. Uh, to establish to Pratishtapayati means to set something down place something in a place which is firm and permanent and safe. So you're establishing, burying for the ages, uh, this sacred relic. And in this case, uh, so that's a key word and we'll, we'll come across it later. In this case, there's an important addition. Quite a few of these inscriptions have this important addition, not all of them, I'll mention some other later. Uh, establishes it where in a previously unestablished place on the earth. 
That is to say, in a place where nobody had established a relic and built a stupa around it before. That's an important special stipulation, which I'll talk about uh, toward the end of my presentation today. Uh, and then there's oh, usually some extra material paying homage to the Buddhas, the solitary Buddhas, that is the Pratyeka Buddhas, um, and of the past, present, and future, the disciples, and mother and father, often, in fact, almost always mentioned. Uh, and then a general blessing, which is not explicitly targeted, but we know from the other examples that he's, what he means is, it leads to, the, to nirvana. It doesn't mean just me, the donor. It means nirvana of everybody in the world, all, all living beings, not just humans, but all living creatures. So these are uh, the key elements uh, of uh, the relics, reliquary inscriptions, and we'll talk about them um, later on in some detail. Um, Ajitsena, as I mentioned, is the king of a place called Odi, Lower Swat Valley. Uh, and I, I'll show a map a little bit later and we'll see where that was. Uh, I like to try to imagine what the actual event of this establishing the relics would have looked like and what would have happened. Uh, surely we have, uh, there would have been some lavish, probably pretty lavish uh, and showy public presentation, especially when the donor, in this case, is the king. And in fact, we have uh, a, another inscription, which I'll show you later, uh, which belongs to uh, Sena Varma, the son, another king who is the son of Ajita Sena. And in that, he actually quotes for himself the words that he spoke at the uh, interment ceremony. Uh, but that's a, a rare little uh, clue. But I like to imagine what the scene was actually like when the king established the relics and that huge celebration, everybody came, lavish, ornate ritual. Uh, and we don't have actual pictures of that, but we have something pretty, what seems to be pretty closely related. This is a sculpture from Barhut, which is not in Gandhara. A lot of people will know it's, it's hundreds of miles away in uh, sort of North Central India. Uh, or uh, east, central eastern India. Um, and uh, it's one of the great stupa sites with hundreds of sculptures and inscriptions. Uh, and right in the front, in the main gate, is this picture of a king or a royal figure, as you can tell from his big turban and these big hoop earrings that uh, royal and high status men are always shown with in uh, ancient Indian sculpture. Uh, and he's riding on an elephant. Imagine that Ajitasena rode in an elephant when he came to inter his relics. And he's holding something in his hand, and as you can guess, probably, uh, that is a reliquary. Uh, so this is something like the scene that I imagine for a royal donation like Ajitasena's. Uh, on the other hand, uh, not all don donations were of that uh, high status, and not all the donors were such powerful or important people. Um, so this is uh, an example of uh, what I would say uh, a more modest reliquary and donation. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, still on display in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Um, it used to be on display with the wrong label. I hope they've fixed that now. I lodged an official complaint, but I don't know if that registered. Um, <laughs> So this is a private, that is to say, a private donation that is to say a donation by an ordinary person. So the text says, um, sorry, uh, says relic of Ramaka, son of Mahashrava. And I, I added in Buddha relic because you could misread it and say it's the relic of the body of Ramaka, but it obviously isn't. It's obviously implied that it's the Buddha relic that belonged to which probably means was purchased by this guy called Ramaka, son of Mahashrava. We have no idea who he is, he's just some guy. Uh, he's, we happen to know him from this single inscription. Um, so I imagine he was the owner of the relic. And I imagine, and here we have absolutely no direct evidence, but I think there must have been a business uh, in relics, as we know, as is well known, there was a large business in 
relics of the true cross, et cetera, in medieval Europe. Uh, but I've not found a single direct reference to that, but I think it's implied here. Um, so it's the relic that belonged to or had been purchased by Ramaka, who lived in Kanti Grama. Uh, again, for those who, if there are any uh, listening who read Kuroshti script in Gandhari, here is Maha Shrava Putrasa Rama Kassa, um, and so forth. Uh, beautiful, clear inscription. They're not always like that at all. It's beautifully written, deeply engraved. Um, and then it says, this relic is established, and there's that word again, Pratithavita, um, by Udita. Uh, and again, he's uh, no known person. He has no titles or uh, honorifics. Uh, so I imagine that for some reason, uh, a relic that belonged to Ramaka was actually ceremonially established by uh, this guy, Udita. Maybe they were relatives or maybe father and son. Uh, we don't know no other information about them. Uh, and then uh, this is the briefest form of the inscriptions. Name of the donor, keyword establish or established, it's always there. Uh, and then the blessing. And this is the minimal short form of the blessing. All worthy of honor are honored. Um, that's like an abbreviation of uh, what we saw above in the inscription of Ajita Sena, where it says all the Buddhas past, present, future are honored, all the per uh, the um, Pratyeka Buddhas, the um, solitary Buddhas are honored, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there are many variations on the theme, but the theme is always essentially the same. And we'll see later examples where those, the co-recipients, the honored persons or the um, pre persons who are, whom the donor wished to incorporate, associate with this pious act of donation, it can be quite elaborate and lengthy, as I'll show you a little later on. But now we're still talking about the, um, the humble, ordinary person, lay person's donations. Uh, and this is something like uh, what I imagined. Uh, this is a, a, sculpt, a fragment of a Gandharan stucco sculpture. Uh, and it shows a donor bearing a miniature stupa. And this stupa is Reminiscent, not exactly like, but reminiscent enough of some of the small stupas that I'll show you uh, shortly. And he's in the ordinary garb of probably a Scythian man in the second, third century AD, give or take. Um, so um, let me show you now an example of one of these miniature stupas. Uh, so this is a stupa cum reliquary or miniature inscribed miniature stupa. Uh, the whole thing is 12.6 centimeters. That is, uh, what is that about? Not even six inches, uh, six, six inches high, uh, but a really beautiful piece of uh, stone, stoneware. Um, and the usual type of donation, uh, type of inscription, donation of Trami, again, an otherwise unknown person, uh, here is his name, faintly legible down here. Uh, Tramissa Danamukhe, the gift of Danamukha. Relics have been established as usual in honor of all the Buddhas. So short formation, uh, the length of the elaborateness of the inscription uh, is often donated, is, is often determined uh, by the size and configuration of the object on which the inscription is written. So this is, a little thing about, uh, I don't know, four inches uh, around in circumference, and that's about all you can text you can fit on there. Uh, if you want to have the full story, uh, the detailed description, then you have to make get one of those gold or silver or copper sheets and write it out, and then that would be, as we saw, crumpled up and stuffed inside the stupa uh, or the reliquary containing the relic. So uh, from now on, I'm going to uh, pose a series of questions or topics, uh, six in all, I think, uh, and run through them one at a time. The first one is, where do these relics come from? Uh, this is an image of a, a particularly beautiful reliquary with a very long, interesting, and reasonably legible inscription um, in Kuroshti script. Like most of the things I'll be talking about, or all of them, I think. 
this is now in the uh, museum, uh, the Asian Museum in Berlin, uh, original fine spot not known, possibly from uh, Bajor region. And uh, the similar, the contents are similar, a silver vessel and a gold one inside that and a smaller gold one inside that and some jewelry and so forth. Uh, I'll return to this inscription a little bit later on. This is just another sample. So now uh, as to the, the where, uh, these inscriptions come from various places in and around Gandhara in the Northwest. Okay, everybody knows approximately where that is. And then here is the inset of that uh, area. And there are three main regions within Gandhara or what I call greater Gandhara, um, where this sort of relic, uh, this sort of uh, objects are, left, are typically found. Uh, one is in and around the border area of around Afghanistan. Here is Jalalabad, uh, very rich in Buddhist antiquities, although it's suffered a very unfortunate fate and many things were lost. Uh, but that's all happened, nothing we can do now. Um, uh, a no large number of this kind of important antiquities of this kind were found in the Swat Valley, which I mentioned uh, earlier to the north of Gandhara proper. This would be Gandhara in the strict sense. Uh, and also in and around the famous site of Taxala on the eastern border or edge of the Gandharan region. So for instance, the, the example I just showed, this one uh, I said was probably from Bajor and that's Bajor, so the Swat Bajor area is one of the rich sources. Uh, and this is just an example of uh, one of the beautiful supas that's still standing more or less in, in the Swat Valley in Pakistan, uh, just to give you some sense of the, uh, of the environment for those who haven't been lucky enough to be there. Uh, and this is another example. This is uh, a, one, another well, relatively very well preserved stupa called Goldara in the Kabul Valley in Afghanistan side. So that's uh, rough approximately where they come from. Uh, unfortunately, in many cases, we don't know exactly where they came from. So many of these things uh, appear on, on the antiquities market with vague or untrue provenances and no real information. That's uh, the occupational hazard in Gandharan studies. So uh, second question, how many reliquaries are there? Um, there are uh, approximately 400 and just slightly over 400 um, reliquaries of this type. Uh, and this is an example of a set of, uh, sorry, uh, uh, a subset of the large collection, which I'll show you in a moment, uh, more or less picked at random, uh, just to give you some very partial idea of the variety of shapes and forms that these relics have, reliquaries have. Um, I mark these two because they'll actually be quite important uh, later in my discussion. So this is the Pasani reliquary, uh, and this is from Afghanistan, and this is the reliquary of Queen Ruhunaka, uh, mentioned uh, in some detail later on. So this image is taken from this book, Gandharan Buddhist Reliquaries, uh, which is published, it's been a while now, it's published in 2012. Um, David Yonward, uh, although he, he rather generously listed himself as a co-author, he was actually the principal author and he did all the legwork tracking down all over the world, uh, these 400 plus uh, reliquaries, documenting them, photographing them, um, and uh, putting together this, uh, this beautiful volume. Uh, so uh, this contains his documentation of all the inscriptions and it should contain some additional material, uh, particularly Stefan Baum's uh, now definitive uh, edition of the 56 inscribed, I'm sorry, that's, that's incorrect. It should be 58 inscri inscribed reliquaries. So there's a long chapter in that book in which he gives 
re-edits and retranslates all of them. And that's now quite authoritative. Uh, they're all in Roshdi script, which looks like this, in case you, anybody is interested to have a, a general sense of it. I won't go into any of the details. Um, and uh, the language of all of these inscriptions is Gandhari, which is, uh, as you may know or not know, uh, is the local vernacular in ancient times of Gandhara, one of, a member of the Prakrit, or more strictly speaking, the Middle Indo-Aryan languages, language group. Uh, so it's uh, related, pretty closely related to Sanskrit and Pali and the decipherment the ongoing decipherment and refinement of our knowledge of the Gandhari language from inscriptions and also from the uh, recently discovered uh, manuscripts, which uh, Alex mentioned in his introductory remarks, uh, the, our ongoing improvement of our language, not knowledge of the Gandhari language uh, is uh, based in large part supplemented, aided by its relationships with Sanskrit and Pali, uh, but it has a lot of curveballs where it doesn't parallel Sanskrit and Pali the way we would have expected. And sometimes we figured those things out and some quite a few remain to be figured out. Anyway, that's what we're uh, dealing with. So my third topic, third topic is forms and formats of the reliquaries, uh, based very much, as I said, on the uh, work of uh, David Youngward. So this is a, a beautiful example. I show it because it's famous and beautiful and important, and it's in the British Museum. So you can easily see it there if you get to go. Um, it's not really typical of reliquaries, uh, but uh, it's worth looking at. Uh, this is as the Caption says the Wardak Vaz inscription. Wardak is a place in Afghanistan, quite far to the west. This is actually from the really the very western fringe of what I call Greater Gandhara. Um, so that's possibly why it's untyp untypical in its format. Um, it's a, a big bronze vase, as you can see, um, which is not the, not a typical material for these kinds of inscriptions. Uh, it's, it's a dated uh, inscription, which is uh, all too rare, uh, and it's a date which corresponds to about 178 AD during the reign of Kuvishka, uh, the last of the great Kushan uh, kings. And that's a beautiful, very beautifully legible inscription. Again, they're not always like that. As I said, this is not so typical. Uh, more typical uh, is this inscription uh, this reliquary with the inscription of Queen Ruhunaka, which I mentioned earlier in that slide where I showed you the various formats, this was uh, one of them. And uh, it's a particularly nice uh, piece of work. Uh, it's schist, soft stone turned on a wheel, as you can see from the designs and also with carved designs uh, and with a, a very interesting inscription, which you can't see because instead of being written here across the body, which would be the more, more usual uh, kind of arrangement, but there are different places and ways to record the inscription. In this case, the inscription is on the inside. And it's not even on the inside of the bowl, it's actually on the inside, on the underside of the lid. Uh, and it's a very important inscription and I'll show it a little bit later on. Um, it's interesting to wonder why they would write the inscription on the inside where nobody would ever see it. Um, and uh, the, my feeling, and I think people generally agree, is that the inscription wasn't, it's more ritual in nature than informative. Uh, it's not there. Maybe at that installation ceremony, but I imagine the king or his herald would read it out with great pomp, but then it would be placed inside the reliquary and the reliquary would be permanently interred in most cases in the um, stupa. Uh, and it would be, perhaps felt to have some power, supernatural, if I can use that fuzzy term, supernatural power to actually cause the wish of the donor. And in the inscription, the, don the inscription will say something, may all, something like, may all the all beings on earth attain nirvana, like the one we saw before. And there might be feeling that that 
those words inside the stupa would actually help to promote nirvana for all living beings. Hope it works. Uh, here is uh, another typical, fairly typical type of reliquary, the pixis shaped container. And if you can think back a little while, the one of the images I showed, uh, the image from Barfoot uh, with the king or the royal person uh, riding on a elephant and he was holding a reliquary and it was very similar in form to this pixis side type. And these are quite common. Uh, this is a reliquary of an ordinary person. He has no fancy titles named Sangharakshita, very typical Buddhist name. Uh, and uh, again, the inscription is written around the base and it's fairly modest. It doesn't go into a great deal of detail, um, but it gives us a, a nice date, the year 60. Just to give you a quick Gandhari lesson. This symbol, um, which looks like a, a backwards E is the number 20. So this is, this is the word for abbreviation for year and it's 2020, 20. That means year 60, it's an additive system like, uh, like Roman numerals more or less. Uh, and then it has, it has the rather funny looking word and funny looking to Indian ears, eyes, Xandika, uh, which actually is the Greek month Xandikos strictly speaking, the Macedonian month, and so forth. Um, and then a brief normative formula around on the back side. Uh, so this is, this year 60 is believed to belong to um, the era that begins in, well, let's say 44 BC. It's a little bit controversial, but that way, so that would put this uh, in about the, uh, about 16 AD early AD period, or CE, I should say. Uh, here's another nice example of a Pixis reliquary, also in a museum in Japan, a uh, well-known reliquary of the Apracha princess Putra. Aprachas were a, a very influential uh, Buddhist and very strongly Buddhist-oriented dynasty in the Bajor region, which I showed you on the map before. Uh, just to the um, to the north or northwest of the Swat Valley. Uh, so this time you have a Pixis reliquary, the base and the top. And in this case, the inscription was written on the lid, but on the outside of the lid. And there's an interesting peculiarity of the inscription. I mean, it's not the textual, but a physical peculiarity of it. And uh, I don't know, maybe looking at it, you can just guess what it is. Uh, it certainly jumps out at me. Uh, it involves these four letters, uh, these four syllables, which are inlaid with gold wire. It's beautiful work. The gold wire is perfectly formed. Karoshti syllables. Here is tu in the word tubu, which means stupa. So this, this stupa, that's what I'm saying. Uh, and then the, don the text is fairly the usual sort of thing. She donates this relic, or this relic, and so forth. So forth. Um, but uniquely, uh, four of these letters were inlaid, and I think it's almost certain that all of the, originally the whole inscription was inlaid with gold. Um, and for God knows what reason, all of the bits of gold fell out or maybe were pulled out by someone except for maybe a grave robber in a hurry. Uh, we don't know. But uh, it, this is an example of the more ornate style of, inscript, uh, of reliquary and relic inscription. And Uttara was a royal princess. So that's fitting that you have uh, something well, fit for a princess, if you will. Um, <clears throat> Here's uh, another example of uh, inscription on, uh, on a metal plate. And this is also on a gold plate. This is the famous, well, famous in my world at least, uh, gold plate inscription of Saint of Arma. Saint of Arma is the son and king who was the son and successor of Ajitasena, who was the donor of the inscription, the gold plate inscription that I showed at the very beginning, the first, the first two images. Um, and this is a uh, fantastic inscription, uh, first published in 19, 78, I think, or somewhere around there, been published 
four or five times since, most recently uh, and definitively by Stefan Baums in the book that I, was, uh, that I showed you earlier. It's the longest inscription, 525 words. Uh, and it's the one, as I mentioned before, where it, where it actually quotes some of the words, ceremonial words of the, uh, the king himself. And uh, this is a, another model, miniature or model reliquary uh, but this is considered much larger than the one that I showed before. This is, uh, I think, about two feet high or more. And this is the reliquary in which this lavish inscription was found. So this is one of the most lavish and uh, ornate and uh, detailed examples of all of this kind of material that we have. Now I turn to uh, my fourth topic, which is sources of the reliquary form. So I tried to give you some sense of the, some of the typical forms. And now uh, I want to say a little bit about where those forms come from, particularly with reference to the theory that they, or some of them, such as this one, were secular objects, not original relic, originally reliquaries, but were, which were repurposed in a Buddhist context for uh, use as reliquary. Um, so here is, once again, the inscription of the Queen Luhunaka. Uh, who was from the same dynasty as Uttara, the woman who donated those little gold letters previously. Yeah, uh, this is the inside. So if you open this thing up, if you take the lid off and look down, you're looking down into the bowl and it looks like this. It's a compartmented bowl. It has a, a, a circular uh, opening at the center and then four compartments uh, around it. Uh, and here, numbers six and seven are objects that were found from Ai Hanum. Ai Hanum uh, was, as some of you will know, the famous Indo-Greek city uh, in northern Afghanistan. Uh, so, uh, and in a non-Buddhist world, but these objects very similar to what we know from a somewhat later period as Gandharan reliquaries were found at Ai Hanum. So this, uh, number eight is the reliquary from Pasani. This is the one I circled uh, when I showed you a page of uh, reliquary types before. Um, and you can see that it's essentially the same object. So the decor is different, uh, but has the same compartmental, uh, in, in, inside uh, compartmentalized base. And these objects from Aikhanum in a non-Buddhist context have been interpreted uh, by archeologists as cosmetic containers. And I, I'm no expert in this, but I, I have no reason to, to uh, doubt that explanation. Uh, and I think that's generally accepted. Maybe they found some items with actual traces of uh, eye makeup and lip gloss and so forth in the compartments. I'm not sure about that, uh, but it's, I think we can take it for granted that these are in fact, uh, um, uh, cosmetic containers. And we know very clearly that these Buddhist pieces that are uh, maybe a century or two later are certainly um, relic, uh, reliquaries. So this seems to be a uh, process of kind of, a kind of cultural adaptation. Uh, the Buddhists of Gandhara inherited or knew of this shape, but reinterpreted and repurposed it for for a Buddhist context. Notice also here, there's this peculiar double lid. This lid goes on top of this one. And so going back to Wakunika's reliquary, this lid, see there's a lip uh, an opening and a lip around it. So there was actually another lid on top of this. So these are the, the sort of double bowl reliquaries. Um, and we see that clearly in the reliquary Shatuleka. I showed that earlier, it's my type slide. Uh, so here's the main bowl, here's the cover, and here's on top of the cover is a little, another miniature bowl on top of the bowl itself. Uh, I don't know what the purpose of that was, if that derives from cosmetic containers, you can imagine some might be useful, uh, but I don't think that's really known, but it is a, interesting peculiarity of several of these objects, there it is, 
uh, and um, Harry Falk, who's done a lot of important work on this material, uh, brought, uh, showed, uh, discussed a what's called an attic double pixis, uh, and suggested that it might be the source, the ultimate source of the double bow reliquary that we get century, several centuries later in Gandhara. Uh, I have no opinion or judgment. Uh, I don't consider myself qualified to judge that, but it's certainly an interesting theory. Uh, still on the theme of repurposing of other objects as reliquaries, uh, this is a, a remarkable example of that. Uh, this is a silver reliquary of Apracha Prince Indravarma. So once again, the Apracha dynasty, uh, the two of the important reliquaries we saw before belong to those, uh, to that line of kings in the Bajar area on the borderlands of Pakistan in modern terms. Uh, so this thing looks uh, completely different from, uh, as far as I know, all other reliquaries. Uh, it's, uh, it does consist of base and cover as usual, and uh, the line, you know, the obvious is across here. So this is one piece at the bottom, and this is an entirely separate piece. And you can see some inscriptions. There are inscriptions actually all over it. There are eight inscriptions that are in all, not all visible. There's the main inscription here. That's the main donation inscription. And it's just repeated almost exactly the same here. And then there are four other smaller inscriptions, which one of which I'll show you a little later. But where is this type, this, uh, this vessel coming from? Well, if you just look at the bottom half, we'll worry about the top half later, uh, the bottom half, and then look at this. This is a Indo-Parthian cup. That is a cup from the Indo-Parthian period, which is a vaguely dated to, let's say, the first half of the first century CE uh, from a major, huge horde of uh, Bajor, uh, from Bajor uh, of silverware of this period. Um, and it contains an inscription, but it's not a Buddhist inscription. This is not a Buddhist object. Uh, the inscription uh, simply uh, records the name of the owner and the weight of the object. So it's kind of a, a property marking uh, inscription. And we find that uh, on quite a large number of uh, similar objects from this area and uh, in and around this area. Uh, this thing originally at the bottom would have had a foot like this, but the feet often are lost, separated and lost. Um, so it's clear that this was originally something else. And it's particularly clear because this is now, uh, let me back up a second. So now I'm showing you a close up of the inscribed area, the major inscription, major inscription, uh, but in it here, unfortunately it's, it's really hardly visible in this image, uh, but this contained an inscription of the same type as the one on the object that I showed before. It just contains the name of the owner, the name of the original owner and its weight. And so these were, uh, this sort of thing, were probably uh, personal, uh, objects, and, and we even have ethnographic data uh, indicating from, from modern culture to this area that this is a, a status item, and a man who has one of these uh, ornate silver cups uh, displays it and shows everybody, and it's an object of status, uh, and that fits in with the fact that they are inscribed with the owner's name. And So what has apparently happened is that Indravarma, the donor, took one or perhaps two of these uh, cups that were his um, property uh, and actually which were, uh, uh, which he inherited from a previous owner whose name is also recorded on one of these four smaller inscriptions. Um, and apparently had this thing remodeled, had a Scythian ibex uh, attached to the top, put the things together and repurposed them into a Buddhist reliquary. And here is the 
relic inscription, which would have been the last of the six inscriptions described, and it's the familiar, uh, the familiar formula, and so Indravarma with his wife establishes these relics, et cetera, et cetera. So you see a little bit of cultural adaptation going on here. Here's the word again. Rajitavati establishes everyone has this. Uh, the fifth topic out of six is earning and sharing the merit. I mentioned before that um, the, uh, the, the the concern, the donors always show great concern for the benefit, the karmic reward of the act of do, uh, donating a, a relic, a reliquary, uh, not only the reward for themselves, but for others. So this is uh, part of a specially ornate inscription, uh, the inscription of Hela Gupta, which I'll talk about in some detail in a little while. Um, so this is one of five plates of this, uh, this size. So again, one of the longest inscriptions of this type. So here's a, a more modest example. Here's a small miniature stupa, uh, it's big, dedicated by an otherwise unknown woman named Khadadatta uh, around 100 AD. Uh, and the inscription, and you can slightly see it here, it's around the top of the base. Uh, this is actually in three pieces. There's a base, and then the drum slots into the base, and then the umbrella shaft is a separate piece that slots into the, uh, top, into the, um, the drum, top of the drum. And the inscription says, Karadatta uh, establishes the stupa, in order to honor her mother and father and to honor all beings. So this is the abridged form of what I'll show you shortly is, it's potentially a much late, longer uh, formula, but it starts with mother and father. They almost always start with that. And it ends with all being. And then other examples, which I'll show you, fill in all the blanks and listing all the relatives and associates and gods and um, who it is, uh, to who, who are being honored, uh, but it all amounts to the same thing in the end. So this is the basic minimum, and this is the maximum. This is the plate that I, uh, another uh, plate that I should, uh, image of the plate that I showed before, copper plates of Hela Gupta, another king around the early first century AD. And you can see that the Buddhist relic cult in Andhara is really blossoming around this period very large number of inscriptions. Um, so this is the expanded version of what in the previous stupa was the uh, minimal version. Uh, and I won't read out the whole thing. And I just uh, put in red the, the basic um, names or categories that is relatives whom he pays special honor to and, uh, and by implication shares the, the karmic merit. His father, his mother, his late wife, the satrap, that is the local ruler, the uh, kshatrapa or satrap, the sons of the satrap, uh, who are gushuras, that's another royal title, uh, his sons, his daughters, the rajapati, again, some kind of um, uh, royal uh, functionary. We don't know exactly what that means. Uh, so that's part of it, and that's far from all of it, and I'll show you a little more later on. I remind you, this, is, this inscription has five plates of this type, so a lot of text. Yeah, so now we come to the last topic, which is what do we learn? And I've subdivided that into three subtopics. One, we learn quite a bit about social history of Gandharan Buddhism, about which we otherwise would know next to nothing. It's really scraps of knowledge, I have to admit, but scraps as opposed to nothing. So uh, this is the same text that I showed before, uh, slightly, uh, 
uh, more, more or less the same text, mostly overlapping. Um, so as we saw, he honored his father and his father's name was Demetrius uh, and his mother, her name was Sudarsana and his wife, her name was Sumagana, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this gives the name of his associates and uh, relatives and other uh, um, professional associates. Um, and what I've done is I've tried to color code the types of names uh, in terms of their ethnic or linguistic affiliations. I hope the colors come out clearly on your screen. Um, there are Greek names. His father was Demetrius. Demetrius doesn't get much more Greek than that. Uh, and his son was Demetrius, but I'll come back to that because there's a little trick about that. Other names are of Iranian derivation. The satrap, the, uh, the, the ruler, Yodifarna, is obviously Iranian. His first four sons, no, please notice he has six sons. His first four sons have these names, which are pretty clearly of Iranian derivation. Uh, then we have purely Indian, sorry, uh, obviously Indian names, his wife, Sudarshana, um, his daughters, all three, four of his daughters have Indian names. Uh, and that may reflect pattern where these Iranians who are recent settlers or probably invaders and conquerors uh, were settling into India and marrying Indian women. Uh, we also have, sorry, we have names which are Indian but ex uh, um, explicitly or typically Buddhist names like his wife Sumagata uh, and also his last son Mahasammata. Uh, particularly interesting is the sequence of names of his sons. He has six sons at the time of this inscription. The first four get Iranian names. The fifth gets a Greek name, which is the same the name of his grandfather, Demetrius, father of Helagopta, father of, Demet of the other Demetrius. So why did he switch at this point in his naming practice? I can only guess. I, I have the idea that uh, he and in his culture, as in many cultures, there may have been a taboo against naming uh, a child for a living relative. Uh, so maybe after Adrofarno was born, his father died, Demetrius died, so he named his next son uh, Demetrius after his late grandfather, just a guess. And then his last son gets a very Buddhist sounding name, uh, Mahasammata. Some of you might recognize is in Buddhist legend was the original king, the first king who ever ruled in the human society. Uh, so he might have, he, Hilagupta, might have had big plans for his uh, youngest son. There's one more point I want to talk about in the what's in a name theme. The name of the donor uh, is given here, I've given following digital practice as Hilagupta. Not really his name, that's a Sanskritized, theory, theoretically Sanskritized version of his name, which is really Hela Utta. Uh, and the suffix Utta uh, has been interpreted uh, originally by Harry Falk, and I've followed uh, Falk in, in my edition of this uh, document uh, as a uh, Gandhar equivalent of Sanskrit Gupta. Hela is certainly not Sanskrit. So the interpretation pro uh, proposed by Harry Falcon, I think likely though not certain to be correct, is that this is actually a hybrid name and that Hela is a Greek element, that's why it's blue, uh, in, the, in the sun, Helios, and Gupta, a common Indian name, naming suffix. So that's a nice theory, it's cute, it may be true. Uh, and if it is, it's very emblematic of this uh, very, eclectic culture that is so characteristic, as everyone knows, of, uh, of the Gandharan Buddhist world, where Greek and Iranian and Indian cultures are all coming together. So coming down near the end, uh, second topic under number six, uh, 6B, political and dynastic history. Uh, I've shown several uh, reliquaries associated with the kings of 
the Apracha dynasty who ruled in Bajor. And this is the seal of Indravarma. The donor of that big silver reliquary was also Indravarma. We're not quite sure whether it's the same Indravarma or a second one. We'll go into those details, it doesn't matter. You know. uh, this is his seal. It's interestingly inscribed here in Rojdi script and here in Brahmi script, which is more typical of central India. Uh, and it gives his name, Indra Varma, the Ishvara, that is the Ishvara. Uh, so this um, Apraksha dynasty, we now know, uh, we have, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, 17 inscriptions of the Apraksha dynasty, and all of them, except for this and one other seal, all of them are uh, reliquary inscriptions. And we can see, I showed you the quite ornate um, donations, you can see that they must have been, although they were a regional uh, kingdom, they were of some influence and were certainly uh, avid supporters of uh, Buddhism. Uh, and we know a fair amount about their history, uh, their dates and genealogy and so forth. But I wanna emphasize, we only know about them besides one or two seals from reliquary inscriptions. And those of you who studied early and in history know that we have to take what we can get. Uh, and, and this is an extreme case uh, where we rely entirely on inscriptions. In, in literature, there's nothing there, like they never existed. Uh, but we can get the uh, text of these 16 or 17 inscriptions, uh, uh, cobble together at least some idea of their genealogy and chronology. Uh, so that's not what the reliquaries were intended to teach to do, but they would do us a favor. Uh, and as an example, I go again to this reliquary of Ruhunaka, which I've shown a couple of times before. And I told you the inscription is on the inside of the lid, so all can now be revealed. And there it is written in spiral fashion, kind of unusually around the inside of the lid. And this inscription, this inscription uniquely has a date in three different dating systems. So here we have the year 27, regnal year of the current king, Vijayamitra year 27. This is that 20 symbol that I noted before on the inscription of Shangarakshita. Then over here, it's dated in the year 73 of the era of King Aziz, which we knew about. Um, so here again, 20, 20, 20, this is a 10, this is obviously one, two, three, added up, seven years, 73. And here, upside down, this is 100 and this is two. Uh, this is uh, one and this is 200. And that date is interestingly labeled as the year of the Greeks. So I won't go into the details of the uh, historical the significance of all this, it gets quite complicated, but the gist of it is uh, from this inscription where we had three dates uh, or three ways of representing the same date at the same time, uh, this solved some of the major problems of the chronology of uh, this period in history, particularly this year of the Greeks, which had been known, um, had been known to exist, but what it was and what it's chronological value uh, was, was very controversial. Um, and uh, so it turned out, well, when I published this, I proclaimed that it showed the proof that the year of the Greeks started in 185 BC. That was then corrected uh, by Harry Falk and a collaborator to uh, 174 BC, uh, but at least I got, got it in the ballpark. Anyway, the point is this inscription, without ever intending to, solved uh, some major historical problems for modern historians. Last topic, and I hope I still have a few minutes, um, really the most important topic. So subtopic 6C, how the relic cult brought Buddhism to Gandhara and beyond. So I showed you before a map of the Northwest and of Gandhara, uh, so this is the land of the Buddha himself, the original or what scholars call the historical Buddha. 
as opposed to the Buddha of legend, myth, et cetera. Uh, so this inset shows the area, areas in which Buddha lived and taught. Uh, and we know this uh, mostly from the, uh, the sutras. Uh, when I say the sutras, uh, I'm talking about the, what the Pali, uh, the, um, the Nikha, what are called in Pali, the Nikayas or in Sanskrit, the Agamas. These are the basic original earliest sutras. And earliest is a dangerous word when you're talking about the history of Buddhism, but I think everyone agrees that they are the, the core of Buddhist literature. And in those sutras, thousands of them, it always begins, the Buddha was staying at such and such a place and he said, oh, such, and such monks were around him and somebody asked such a question. They always give the location. So that gives us a very nice idea of uh, where the Buddha lived and where he wandered and taught in his life. Unfortunately, and surprisingly to the modern mind, they always tell you exactly where this happened and what happened. And they never ever mention a date. So we don't really know when the Buddha lived. I mean, you can find, read about it in one book or another. And, uh, but the dates, uh, different people will tell you a different date. We don't know. But we do know, and this is what matters from the current topic, we do know where the Buddha lived and taught. And he, we know he was uh, born in Lumbini, uh, and we know that he died or should say attain nirvana in Kushinagara. We know that he did most of his teachings in Shravasti and in Nalanda and Rajagir and Kalsambi and Sarnath and so forth. So this inset, and it's really the Eastern part of this inset was where the actual, the original, where Shakyamuni the Buddha was and taught. Uh, something like this. Gandhara is way up here. In fact, it's off the map. I'm pointing up there to the Northwest. Uh, so uh, historians will certainly agree that the Buddha was never in Gandhara or even near Gandhara. Uh, of course, faithful legends arose, pious legends arose about the Buddha's uh, trips to Gandhara, but a story, to a historian, those are in the realm of myth or legend. <laughs> and yet, Gandhara, as I said a moment ago, plays a crucial role in the spread of uh, Buddhism. Well, this is, I'm coming back to the, my first image, the gold leaf inscription of uh, Ajitasena. And I emphasized before the term establishes to firmly fix in place. And I want to emphasize again here, this stipulation excuse me, that we find in Many of these inscriptions, uh, about a dozen in all, uh, the further stipulation, in a previously unestablished place on the earth. And what that means, it alludes to a textual, a textual reference that's found in several different Buddhist texts in, in variant forms, which says that by putting a relic in a place where it never was before, you get, if you'll excuse the expression, a kind of extra credit. Uh, when you establish a relic or when you worship a relic, you get punya, that is uh, merit, karmic merit, makes good things happen to you in the future. But if you do, do that, if you put a relic in a place where it never was before, you get brahma punya, which is like super punya. Uh, and uh, what it means, it's the right, uh, described in other texts, uh, you get reborn in heaven for a, an entire kalpa, an eon, which is a, a billion, zillion years, preparatively described, a super long period. So that um, the stipulation was known for, to have occurred in maybe 10 different inscriptions. Uh, it was most clearly articulated and explicitly articulated in these fairly recently discovered in uh, copper plates of Hela Gupta, uh, where it says, and here I've, and for the Roshi readers, if any, I've circled the, uh, uh, the key phrases. Um, and in this inscription, the composer quotes the master, that is the Buddha, of course, as telling this uh, doctrine that if you establish a relic, 
in the place where it was not previously established, you get you establish this Brahma merit for yourself. So this doctrine evolved, some would say, was dreamed up in order to, presumably in order to spread the, uh, the relic cult uh, and to spread Buddhism with it. Uh, so it's quite striking that we get this, we see this over and over in a fair number of Gandharan inscriptions. So that doctrine, we can imagine that was being taught, was being preached maybe by the local uh, Buddhist masters, uh, emphasizing the importance of uh, uh, buying, buying relics and establishing them, and in the process, literally implanting Buddhism in the soil of Gandhara. Um, what happened after that, uh, some people will know, and I won't go into it, it's just uh, the next chapter in the story, which is that uh, Buddhism spread into other parts of Asia, first into inner, uh, Central Asia, and then into China, and then into East Asia, China, and Korea, Japan, etc. cetera. Um, and we know quite clearly now that that started in Gandhara. Gandhara was the, uh, people use the term springboard, uh, from which uh, Buddhist teachers or just followers uh, traveled over the mountains into Central Asia and literally brought Buddhism into uh, the rest of Asia. So uh, in this sense, Gandhara played a special role and relic, a special role in turning Buddhism into a world religion rather than just an Indian religion uh, and the relic cult and with special stipulations of that uh, were what underlay the, the special influence and historical role of uh, Gandharan Buddhism. And I think that's enough. Uh, I'm glad to answer questions uh, and go discussions. Thank you for listening. And service Kino Bhavantu means everybody be happy. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm going to give the, the floor to Osmond and Alex to, to sort of start a discussion, perhaps with a few key questions or, or comments on uh, Richard's presentation. Osmond, do you want to start? Maybe Alex. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> Richard, uh, thank you very much for this wonderful talk and the wonderful material you shared with us. One uh, question that came up in the Q&A box regards the relics. Um, what can you say about the materiality of the relics? As far as the inscriptions are concerned, are they uniformly identified as Shakyamuni relics, as Buddha relics? And also, um, you know, you showed this crumpled up metal sheath at the very beginning and there were different iterations. Might they have been used to wrap relics up so that they would be kind of the final layer um, in which relics are enclosed? Yeah, well, you know what the problem is? Most of these objects I showed were not properly excavated. They, they just they appear on the market and go to whatever museum or disappear into whatever collection. So we don't have the the uh, the good information. Um, but I don't think the um, that those plates were wrappers um, because well it is assumed and i think there are positive examples of that, that the relics would actually be inside the smallest of those uh, mm -hmm. containers and i don't think you could take that copper sheet and uh, a gold sheet or whatever and put it inside that tiny reliquary i mean there are places like the some of the italian excavations in swat and Bukhara, there are cases where um, relics were actually properly documented uh, but there are relatively few and, and none in which these um, uh, inscribed sheets were involved. And um, I'm sorry, there was another part the, of your question. Yeah, I was, I was, oh. we were wondering um, what you can say about the actual materiality. Are mm. they bone fragments? Are they pearls? And mm. also, are they invariably identified in the donative inscriptions as pertaining to the Buddha rather than to one of his disciples? 
No, well, the second part of the inscript of your question is interesting. In, I believe every case, it says inscriptions of the Buddha or of Shakyamuni Buddha. So I know of no examples in Gandhara uh, where there's relics of persons other than Shakyamuni, which is inter an interesting um, geographic, geographic peculiarity because from places like, for instance, Sanchi in central India, we do have reliquaries containing the uh, relics uh, supposedly of Shariputra and Malkalyayana and the other local teachers. Um, and in other parts of India as well, you find that. Um, so I interpret that as reflecting this, this doctrine of the, the Brahma merit, uh, that there is this special feature of, uh, of interring, and it says specifically the bones of the Buddha that produces Brahma merit. Uh, as far as the actual physical remains, I don't know of any good documentation of what there is. Usually, I mean, I've seen pictures and they just look like ashes, just look uh, looks like a pile of ash. Um, and I don't know of any really scientific study of uh, these, the contents. Again, the circumstances are problematic, frankly. Thank you. Osman, do you want to move us on? Um, no questions, Rich. I just wanted to tell you, I think Sanjot was there when Rick, uh, Rich presented the inscription with the three three dates. It was a revolution for us, and it was a wonderful beginning of a new era. As, as Alex said in your new book, uh, we, are, we are living in a golden age. Um, for many reasons, this is what, I mean, this is what you told, wrote in your book, because, I mean, 1980s and 90s, that this was the period where we found so many coin hoards, and then inscriptions giving so much information about chronology and about the, especially the Aprachurajas, and then the text. I mean, you didn't talk today, but it was not the purpose of today's talk and finding so, so many Mahayana Sutras mm -hmm. and also uh, solving so, so many problems about the, to understand the iconography of that period, especially the Buddhist iconography. So that's, that's something that we are very lucky. Uh, the amount of work you did with your uh, Shishya Parampara, like um, as Alex mentioned, like Timothy Lenz, Mark Allen, Stefan Bounds, Jason Ellis, and others. So the, your tradition will continue and more and more inscriptions will be found and also reliquaries. For the moment, we have only 58 inscribed reliquaries, but I am sure we are going to find some more and it's going to be a wonderful. We are very fortunate to live in this uh, uh, period. And I just want to thank you, Rich since we have been working together for so many years. And great, thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words. I, I do have a couple of questions. Please. I don't want to take up too much time and also um, ask some of the questions that have been posed in the, in the Q&A box. Mm -hmm. So there was a proposition once that, that you know, a lot of the, the relic cult in Gondara is very different, um, uh, that, that they, they, it often is reminiscent of gold burials. Uh, so a lot of people have made the argument, uh, or a lot of people, uh, some scholars have made the argument that it, that the relic cult in Gondar also connects to to sort of local funerary, funerary customs where you have these these treasure deposits rather than the deposits of the remain the the the, the, the bodily remains of the of the Buddha. And I was reminded when you talked about repurposing that a lot of the, the reliquaries that you showed are, are similar to some of the material, for example, that was found uh, in Tiliatete, uh, the early century. The gold flower. You know, the, the actual, the reliquary, the schist reliquary um, container types. Uh, so not the gold, in fact, but the, the, the Chelyatepe burials are, are gold, but, but the cosmetic containers 
Wow. Uh, that were buried with the deceased are identical to some of the, the Buddhist reliquaries. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I guess my question is, you know, if, if you were to, to sort of separate uh, for those perhaps who are not very familiar with, with the, the traditions, what would you say were sort of the main characteristics or distinctions between the relic cults that developed in Gandhara? and the relic cults that existed prior, um, if, if any. Well, yeah, um, you mean relic cults, what is relic cults of other regions, are you asking me? No, or of India or, or uh, um, the, the custom of, of enshrining the relics of, of the Buddha or Buddhist teachers. Um, if you compare the, the Gangetic Valley with, for example, a place like Gandhara, you know, what would be the distinction and does it inform us of anything that's happening locally in, in Gandhara? Well, yes. And part of my answer to your question would be my answer to Alex's question about whose relics are they? And, and, mm -hmm. and uh, in Gandhara, there are always the relics of Buddha Shakyamuni. Um, in India, they are, well, actually in India, I mean, continental India, or peninsular India, I guess you'd say, uh, the number of reliquaries and the number of inscribed reliquaries is, I believe, much smaller than in Gandhara. And I, I when I worked with David on Yonward on that book, I investigated that uh, not, uh, not as extensively as I theoretically would have liked to, but I looked around and the number of reliquaries and the number of inscribed reliquaries in India proper or in peninsular India is, is much smaller than in Gandhara, even though Gandhara is geographically a small, a relatively small area. Um, so you get the impression, I got the impression, I gave myself the impression that the relic cult was not as developed in, in Indian and in Buddhist India generally. And another thing is um, what's even more harder to find in India is inscribed Buddhist reliquaries. I mean, I found only a handful. I, I'm sure I missed some. And since I wrote that, at least Peter Skilling point, pointed out one more important example, but it's still, very small, or right? it's you know 58 in Gandhara, and maybe a dozen, or not much more than that, in all of the rest of India. So that again is one of the reasons that I feel that uh, relic cults had some special importance in the Gandhara region or in the northwest. And, and uh, Richard, if I may ask, I mean, you started us off with this um, term patistapayati to use the Sanskrit mm -hmm. word. So could one make the argument that the relic cult served, you know, obviously it serves a generation of punya for the people, for the donors, but that it also in a sense served to not only establish these particular relics, but Buddhism at large, and that give, yeah. given a peripheral region, this was particularly important, unlike in the heartland of Buddhism. That, that is exactly what I'm thinking. Um, I don't know whether the people who did this were explicitly thinking of that, uh, but it was certainly the effect and maybe the, uh, um, the underlying motivation, maybe unconscious or maybe just automatic uh, motivation. Uh, yes, definitely. It's also a kind of tangible way to make the Buddha present in a way that, you know, yeah. away from the area where he's actually located in terms of his historical life and the places uh, that can be associated with um, his, um, you know, whether it's, it's, it's particular episodes in, in his life and that the relic cult served as a kind of way to make, make him present, you know, through, through the relics yeah. Yeah. Uh, in a very well, tangible way. Yeah. Um, well, as I said, there also are well-attested legends of Buddha's trips to Gandhara, so that's another way that that is achieved. And of course, you know, this is not a matter of intention to deceive people, it's with sincere belief uh, on the part. Uh, and yeah, I, I, as I said during my talk, I, I wish we had knew something 
about how those relics got to Gandhara. I mean, physically, uh, but there is, I know, no information and there are no references in the text. It's just they're there. And there doesn't seem to be any question about how they got there. What about Richard? I was wondering, sorry to interrupt. I was wondering, so we have this preponderance of, um, you know, material culture that points to the relic cult. Um, what about the textual evidence? Does that in some way reflect it? Are there local texts or texts with a local um, kind of um, override that speak to the relic cult so that it's also reflected in textual evidence? Not explicitly the way we might want. Um, I, I would refer you to the uh, volumes in the Gandharan Buddhist text by Tim Lenz. Uh, where, which contain uh, some manuscript evidence of legends, which talk about not explicitly relics, as far as I can recall, but they really seem to be describing the encounter of Buddhism with the local culture. Uh, and they record in, in very scrappy, obscure, difficult terms, but clearly they, they're people like, um, you know, local, um, satraps talking to a Buddhist monk and apparently discussing Buddhism, um, but nothing quite as explicit as we'd like. I, I want to go back to Sanjo. Um, um, uh, I wanted to add, I mean, how did the relics get there? In the mind of the pious Buddhist in you know, Gandhara in 100 AD, uh, I think if you ask that question, the answer would be, well, everybody knows Ashoka multiplied the, you know, the eight relics into 80,000, or was it 80,000? 84,000. 84, yeah, and so some of them came to, came to us, of course. And it, I think it would not phase that my ancient Gandharan friends that I sometimes talk to in my head, um, it would make perfect sense according to their logic. Um, but uh, in terms of our modern point of view, how did they get there or how were they created and how were they distributed? Nothing. I, I wonder if I, I have not gone deeply at all into the history of the relic cult in medieval Europe. Um, maybe you could come up with some plausible parallels, but it's, it's all guesswork, I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah, there's something that one has to bear in mind regarding the relics and inscriptions they were not to be seen. Yeah. Yeah, they were in relic chambers and they were only for the merit, and especially the inscription that you showed where the inscription is under the lid. I mean, it's inside the lid. So nobody mm -hmm. can see that even at the moment when it was deposited. So that aspect mm -hmm. has to be taken into consideration that these things were made only for the merit purpose. Because once they were, I mean, deposited, then the stupa was built and nobody would have seen them. So it's, a, it's a, so it's something that we need to, this is different from what is happening in Greek and Roman world. Uh, in the funerary monuments where the inscriptions were to be seen, they were not hidden. But in the, in the, uh, in the Buddhist context, they were inside the stupa and nobody ever saw them. So this is for you, this is for your merits. They of, and that, I think, if I may just add to this, uh, what Osman says um, speaks a little bit against your um, presumption, Richard, that there might have been a similar business in relics as in medieval Christianity, where the relics are, of course, displayed. And uh, in that sense, it's kind of easier to wrap your mind around that they, um, you know, translate into monitor, you know, into, into business value. Um, I'm wondering, it's just... Yeah. Yeah, it's all, that side of it, it's all speculation. Uh, well, the only thing close to documentation is, uh, I mentioned briefly in the inscription of uh, Saint of Arma, uh, the long uh, gold inscription, not the one that I showed at the beginning, but the second one, the very long inscription. Uh, and there, uh, very untypically, it is recorded in first person, the, the you know, procedure in the first person. Everywhere else, it's third person. Just say so and so dedicates to such and such relic, such and such a place. Um, in the in the um, uh, 
Saint of Arma inscription, it actually starts out and it says, I, King Saint of Arma, bow to the feet of the Sangha. And, um, and then he tells how he replaced the, the, these relics were in a stupa and the stupa was hit by lightning uh, and the relics were exposed, interestingly. It shows, what he says, something like exposed. And then I uh, replaced them. He really describes the, the ceremony. So that's I said, the closest thing you get to some description of the actual relic. So there was some idea that, yeah, those relics had to be covered, that be, somehow being revealed uh, was, was a terrible thing. Um, so that supports what Osman said, that they're not, not meant to be seen. Um, it doesn't tell us where they came from. Um, if, if you're willing, Richard, I will read a few of the, the questions. Um, I can read them out loud or um, we can take them from the top to the bottom. Um, John Soriano has a question. Could the earlier spherical and cylindrical small relic containers resemble earlier larger and perhaps non-extant monumental big stupas? Oh, definitely. Um, I didn't go into that, but uh, yeah, these are these small stupas. Um, I, I refer to them as model stupas, or I, I don't know if I said that, but that's what I a common term. Uh, and what I mean is they are models of the great stupas. And I showed early on the, the remains of, a, of the Amukdara stupa. Um, so absolutely, I mean, that's, uh, that's well established. Um, and, and if in certain parts of Pakistan, Swat Valley particularly, uh, I mean, you can just drive up and down the Swat Valley and see these things. In, well, you have to know where they are because they're off the main road, but they're all over the place. Mm -hmm. Some of them are just amazing. And there's, there's a question about um, what's mentioned in Chinese sources uh, that Buddha relics were abundant in, in Gandhara, uh, yet archeologists have found very few, um, even when they excavated uh, stupas, uh, they, they were found, hard, hardly any relics were found within. Can you talk a bit about this quote, apparent discrepancy? Are there any theories to explain this? Yeah, um, there, there have been disappointments. Um, and uh, but this is uh, addressed, I think there are textual references, which I, I can't pull out of my head at the moment, um, but a, a stupa, doesn't have to have relics. You can have a stupa that's just kind of a mental um, relic, re recollection of the Buddha. Um, and uh, a lot of these are, are looted, I mean, through history from ancient times to modern times, especially modern times, they get looted. And if there were gold relics and so forth, they're usually gone. A few lucky cases where they're uh, survived. And uh, yeah, I don't know of really good scientific studies of what has been found inside these uh, relics. It's, it is disappointing. Um, there was one case, uh, I don't remember where, it was not in Gandhara, it might have been in Sri Lanka, uh, which was a little bit sensitive where there was a, a bone in what was supposed to be a relic and it was examined and it was revealed to be a bone of a horse. So uh, some people were not happy with that result, uh, but that's one of the things that makes me think they must have been a trade in alleged relics as, as you know, as in the case of ancient, in, in the case of medieval Europe, where, you know, they say if, if you add it up, all of the relic, the fragments of the true cross, it would be a mile high or something like that. And that's the nature of relic cults. It multiplies yeah. itself. And I think there are quite a, a couple of examples from China as well. So that, yeah, yeah I agree. I think there was, and not all of it, but there certainly would have been that a, a kind of commercial aspect mm -hmm. to it as, as well. Um, did you find in some reference about sweet substances of sugar in all this materials? 
He's looking at the exchange of techniques in sugarcane production between India and China through Buddhist sutras. Okay, that's okay. That that's a new one, but uh, but it makes me think of. It brings my mind. There's at least one case, and I think a few cases where inside stupas, I think the Manikyala stupa, if I remember correctly, Osman, that there was some kind of tube that contained some sort of gooey liquid. Yes, um, yeah, this and, is the one that the French uh, generals of Napoleon excavated. That's Manikyala, uh, you are right. And is there any knowledge of what that, that thick liquid no, was? No. We have, I mean, I was trying with Stefan to find it. Normally it should be in Paris. Mm -hmm. Because this was done by General Court and Ventura, the former generals of Napoleon, and they were brought to Paris. So we have been working on it to find it. But we know what it yeah, was there, but no scientific analysis was ever done on that, unfortunately. Uh, and I think there were other examples of that. Maybe Gregory Chopin wrote an article about that. I'm vaguely remembering, yeah. but I can't pull up any details. Alex, you had a yeah. I, I'm you know I'm looking at a, a question by um, Bob Goldman, our Sanskrit mm -hmm. professor here at Berkeley, That's and he right. raises the question whether Hela Gupta couldn't be whether the Hela and Hela Gupta couldn't be understood to be an Indian name like in the name Hela Raja, the commentator on the Vakya Padia. Mm -hmm. I'd actually also wondered whether there weren't possibilities of reading it this way. Yeah. Um, yeah, it could be the Hela is, is a bit of a guess, um, but it, it seemed plausible because we have Greek names. I mean, even in that very inscription, we have several other Greek names, but Hela in Indian names, I think only occurs relatively late. I'm not sure if that's true. Um, and uh, yeah, it's... Um, and, uh, and the, the Utta, it, I remind you, it's, it's, his name isn't really Hela Gupta, it's Hela Utta. Uh, oh, so yeah. okay. he, even the Gupta part of it is mm -hmm. a sort of best guess. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't bet a large amount of money on either part of, on the, the conventional um, uh, interpretation of either half of that name, but it's been, it's sort of got canonized that way. I don't know, I have, I even have had moments of regret, you know, I, when I republished that article, just left that inscription last year, and I called the article the Hela Gupta inscription, I wonder if I should have done that, maybe I should have called it the Hela Gupta inscription, rather than canonizing a rather uncertain etymology. Yeah, that's the way things go. Um, it becomes true, even though it's not true. There was a question from Professor Duncan McRae. Could you talk more about the speech act acts of these texts? Is there a significant to the present verb tense for the verb to establish? And that's an interesting uh, question. And I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm sort of running through my files in my head and there, it's sometimes, it's often in the present tense, as in some of the examples I showed, but it's also pretty frequently, I think, in the past participle. So you get forms like prati, prati tavida, corresponding to Sanskrit, pratishtapita, uh, and then you know, the passive construction by so and so, these relics are, uh, in, are um, established. But, so it seems like that, that would mean the answer is no, but actually you can read that past participle construction as kind of a present, what we call in English, a, a, you're calling in English a present, past present, I, I, English, I can't do any, um, present past, what do you call that in English? I have seen, past perfect, present perfect, uh, okay. So they're either in the present or in what's approximately the equivalent of present perfect in English. Um, so it's have been, but it, it refers to the immediate past. So I think, yeah, it does, the, those phrasings 
do um, make it seem like the, it's an act, it's actual, it's a speech act as the questioner. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name of the questioner. Um, Duncan? Dalton, oh, okay. Duncan McRae. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, and I, I refer back to what I've already mentioned a couple of times that there is this one case, say Navarma, where he actually, you actually hear the king speaking first person, present tense. Uh, so I, I imagine these inscriptions being read out by the king or by the herald. And so it is uh, very much a speech act in, in, the, in the present time when that was being done. And even the past tense, it's like saying, they, these relics have been, or being hereby, or have been hereby established. You could read it as referring to the moment, in the moment. I'll pick one and then Alex, maybe you'll pick the last one. Okay. Um, is there any mention, this is from pa Ditrasen, uh, is there any mention of King Melinda and Nagasena in any reliquary of the area? Okay, I was just working on that yesterday. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there is, uh, Osman probably knows where I'm going on this, it gets a little interesting. Uh, there is a famous reliquary called the Shinkot or Bajar reliquary, which was actually really the first of these reliquaries to ever have been discovered or come to the attention of scholars. Um, and it's also one of the oldest. And it contains a series of inscriptions. It's actually a rededication like that Saint of Arma that I mentioned. The reded rededication is quite a common pattern uh, apparently because, you know, these things would be put in stupas and what's on top of the stupa? Huge umbrella shaft of stone and wood. And what does that attract lightning? Uh, and we know that often stupas were destroyed by lightning. They'd have to be reopened and re ritually reinterred. Well, um, this Shinkot reliquary was like that. It was reinterred at some point Again, by one of these kings, these Bajor kings who were so big, influential on the relic cult. But there's a fragment of the earlier inscription and the early inscription is dated in the, during the reign of King Melinda, um, which is quite interesting. Um, it was proposed by Harry Falk that that's actually a forgery um, and I, did a whole thing on that, I uh, worked on it, thought about it. And I actually don't agree with Harry Falk on that. I think the reference to the King Melinda was uh, genuine, but it doesn't refer, it only refers to Melinda in the context of the date. So he's not, so it's not that he's the, own, the donor or being actually um, involved in, in uh, the, uh, the ceremony itself. Uh, but it does attest pretty clearly to the presence of the, the really the earliest presence, presence of the Buddhist relic cult in Gandhara during the reign of King Melinda. Um, and uh, I'll just mention, I'm working on a, a very fragmentary manuscript from you know, about the, the same period that most of these things are coming from. Uh, and it, it's not, it's not the Melinda Panya, you know, that we've sort of been expecting and hoping to find, but it is somehow related and it uh, refers to the monk Nagasena, who's the interlocutor with King Melinda and the questions of King Melinda. Um, so it's another sort of marginal uh, evidence of the presence of King Melinda in Gandharan Buddhism, um, but uh, the details are being worked out with much agony, it's very fragmentary, but we'll see what comes of that, no promises. Okay, one more, Alex. Yeah, well, I, it, it's a question that came in uh, towards the end of the uh, box, and it's a question that, um, you know, um, connects to what we discussed earlier. So given that there seems to be much greater pro popularity and preponderance of something like a relic cult in the Gandharan region, than in the Buddhist heartland, 
could one conclude that uh, this is more of a Greek or Indo-Scythian um, Shaka phenomenon uh, rather than an Indian phenomenon? Of course, you know, Indian ideas of uh, purity and the pollution of death and so on come to mind when discussing this. Well, you know, I didn't mean to say that there wasn't a relic cult in mainland India. And I, I think, first of all, of the Patala inscription, uh, which is um, very early, Brahmi fr from the real, you know, Buddhist center of the original Buddhist world, um, and uh, um, explicitly refers to the, the Salila uh, Sharira, uh, the body of the Buddha. Of course, there, you know, there are so many gray areas. Uh, there was a idea of some years ago that that was a forgery uh, because it was associated with, um, what was the name, Anton Fuhrer, who was a notorious character in 19th century Buddhist anthology. Um, but I don't think that amounted to anything. I think everybody pretty much concluded that it is genuine. So there you have a pretty clear uh, early and notable attestation of the cult. Uh, and you get it also in some other places in Sanchi and in some places in Maharashtra. Um, so I don't have the impression that it's particular that uh, in Gandhara, that that was particularly well. It's true, as Sanjay mentioned, that uh, the types, the reliquaries, um, are very similar to um, what you find in in uh, Tepe, which is a very Scythian, if I can use that. I mean, very non-Indian cultural artifact. Um, but my guess is it's just the physical containers that. Gandhara and Buddhists got from, from, let's say, outside or the West or the North, uh, but I would say not the idea of the relic cult. I think uh, that does come from India, even though it's less prominent there. Okay, well, I want to um, tell everybody who did uh, enter a question. There, there were many. Um, no. Uh, all the information is saved, so we'll be sure to pass it on to Richard, um, so he can uh, just read your comments and also the questions that were not answered live uh, today. It's almost four o'clock, so we really have to put an end to, to the webinar. Um, I very much want to thank, thank Richard for joining us today and sharing his research and his ideas about uh, Gandharan uh, Buddhism. I want to thank Alex von Rospat and uh, Osman Boperachi for their willingness to uh, join as uh, moderator discussants. And of course, finally, I want to uh, thank all of you. Uh, there were many. I think we had, you know, about 250 people, if not more, who joined us uh, today. Um, and um, thank you all for, for coming. Um, and uh, we hope to see you at our next Gandhara talk, which will be mid-April, uh, April 16th. Jesse Pont will talk about viticulture in Gandhara uh, under the title, uh, Where Wine Was Drunk. Uh, and that will be our, our final talk in the Gandhara series. We are going to upload a conversation between Julia White and Osman Boperachi talking about the upcoming exhi uh, exhibition at the, the Berkeley Art Museum and that will be uploaded uh, as a webcast onto our, onto our website. Uh, finally, thank you, Sky, for managing the, uh, the webinar. And um, we look forward to seeing everybody next time. Take care. Thank you.